Before we begin, three messages. When my company needed to develop a key mobile product, one that I was counting on as a new source of revenue, I knew exactly who to turn to. Macadamian. They delivered on time, with incredible attention to detail, and I was able to get product into customers' hands faster than I ever thought possible. I've personally known them for 10 years, and they do make great products even better. Check them out at www.macadamian.com. Here's a riddle. How do you build native cross-platform mobile applications quickly without having to rewrite code and hire consultants at a huge cost? Titanium from AppCelerator. Called the easy button for mobile application development, it allows you to focus more on what's important, getting product out the door. Join the more than 1.5 million active developers who have created over 13,000 apps at www.abcelerator.com. So, you've taken some of the advice that has come from Untether.tv guests, built an app, and now you're turning your attention to generating some hard-earned revenue. Then you should be looking at Pontiflex App Leads. Some of your peers who are using App Leads are earning CPMs 100 times the industry average. And if you need any other reasons to start, I'll give you two more. You can run sign-up ads from top brands, the ones that you recognize, and it won't take your precious users out of your app. Go to appleads.com, that's A-P-P-L-E-A-D-S dot com to sign up. Hello everybody, welcome to Untether.tv. My name is Rob Woodbridge, your host, as we take this tour among mobile entrepreneurs and those guys that are paving the way for this new technology to uh, jump into mainstream, where we actually sit down and have these casual conversations with mobile rock stars, as you know that for now. And um, I'm joined today uh, by uh, Hemi Weingarten, who is the co-founder of a company called Fu Fujicate. And I'm just going to paint a quick picture about what Fujicate. The interest here is obviously in the health space. I, I you know, I'm a health nut. I, uh, I love eating right. And I believe that mobile has an ability to actually help everybody eat properly. Um, we, are ne we have never been at a time where so much information is available w at our fingertips wherever we go in whatever capacity, uh, you know, whether it's a store, uh, food store, retail store, doesn't matter. This is a pretty amazing time to, to be carrying these devices around and Fujicate fits right into that when it allows you to see the, uh, what the quality in, of content is in your products. And I'm going to get Tammy to explain it a little bit deeper. But a uh, big fan of applications like this and came across Fujicate. Had to get Hemi on here to talk about it. And uh, here he is. Hemi, thank you for coming on and, and sharing the story. Really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Rob, for having me. So um, talk sure. about uh, what what was the inspiration for this? I mean, I'm a health guy. I, like a, you know, I, I try to feed my kids properly. I try to feed myself properly. So uh, what was the attraction uh, for Fujicate and mobile for you? So the, the magic word, kids. Kids. Uh, <laughs> you would have asked me a few years ago, uh, would I ever do anything that has to do with nutrition? I'd laugh in your face. Uh, I'm a technology guy. Uh, uh, I do startups for, for fun and pleasure and, and usually profit. And, uh, <laughs> usually profit. Well, Untether's a non-profit, not on purpose, but it is a non-profit. <laughs> Not yet. well. I'm, I'm one for one with my previous startup. I, I hope uh, Fujicate will succeed. It, it's a much more important mission than my previous company. In any case, um, I was starting my family out in uh, the Bay Area, and uh, I have three kids, uh, a son and twin daughters. And I think uh, it was around the time that my daughters were a year or 18 months old that my wife came home from the supermarket with a glow in the dark yogurt. I kid you not, this is a, a kiddie brand yogurt um, where there are cartoon characters on the, on the box and uh, it's a very bright color. It's a pink that does not seem natural. <laughs> and uh, for the first time in my life, I read an ingredient list. Um, don't get me wrong, it's not that I don't like food. I, I just usually prepare a lot of food at home, so we're big foodies. And being slim, my wife and I, we have lucky genes. Yep. We never really cared about nutrition. But when you have kids, you start to care more. So back to this yogurt, I read the ingredient list and I see red number 40 label there. It's an artificial color. It's made from uh, charcoal, uh, from coal tar or something like that. Basically, it's a carcinogen and it causes hyperactivity in kids. And it's being phased out in Europe. 
and I had no reason to believe that the FDA should approve it as a safe uh, additive to foods. But there it was in my kids' yogurt. So I started researching the food industry and I realized that uh, it's optimized for two things, low cost and high profit for the food industry. There's no care at all about my kids' welfare or anybody's welfare for them, for a mat as a matter of fact. This led me on a year-long research project and at the end I decided that I have to do something about this and that's how Fujicate was born. It started as a blog where I simply wrote about discoveries I made in uh, products and interesting ingredients. Um, but uh, the iPhone had come out around this time and it was clear to me that uh, mobile devices were going to change the way I do my grocery shopping. And I found a, a great bunch of uh, people to join me on this journey and we started a company called Fujicate. And about six months ago we launched the Fujicate iPhone app, um, which I'll be happy to show in a minute. And just a week ago, we also launched an Android version, so we're very excited. And the whole idea, as you briefly mentioned before, is to help people make better choices, healthier choices for themselves and for their families. Well, it, it, I mean, go back to the blog for a second, because that, that's a really interesting aspect, is that, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, um, companies that I've seen that this is a very competitive um, arena, right, which is the health and, and well-being and, and uh, food sourcing uh, space, especially in the app space, because it just, as you said, it's a natural extension. I'm at the, I'm at the mall. I'm shopping at my grocery store. Uh, I want to get all the information that I can. Um, but the blog's an interesting s spot because uh, you didn't set out to build an app. the The app was the outcome of all of that research that you've done, right? Well, I, I had in my mind some idea of what I want to do, but I didn't know exactly what. Um, and somebody gave me a good piece of advice. As you do your research, instead of just writing it down in your notebook or saving it as files on your computer, why don't you blog about it and mm -hmm. share it with the world and start a discussion? It was a wonderful piece of advice. Um, basically, when I look back on it, we started marketing Fujicate three, uh, three years ago, which is two, years, two and a half years before we actually launched a product. So by the time we launched our app, we already had a nice following a really sizable following of people who cared about nutrition, of people that are experts in the field. I have many uh, scientists, uh, nutrition experts, dietitians, pediatricians that follow the blog. And uh, it was great when we launched uh, to get this uh, word of mouth out through this uh, the blog following. Well, I think that follows very well. 37 Signals uh, in, in the States uh, has a, uh, a really... Uh, similar path is that they've built a great following through their through their blog and I read their book too yeah exactly and people read it because i mean it's it's a, a new way of working i mean they're authors obviously as well they've written a couple of books um but they, they say that very clearly that the best thing that they can do is build up a following and then launch something that would be appealing to that following right so you know marketing uh people are always asking me and i'm sure they're asking everybody uh, uh -huh. who's in this business how, how do i how do my apps rise above the other ones and and you've got to start with a following don't start with zero start with something and uh, obviously that's what you know ultimately uh, you were able to do by by you know putting your thoughts down in a blog and then the outcome of that is two and a half years later as you said is an app that is now launched into a, a group of people that are um you know looking for something like this obviously yes so uh, you launched it six months ago and I mean, what what has been the reaction to something like this? You know, obviously you launch it to a to a waiting audience. Uh, did you see did you see an immediate spike in downloads? Did you rise above? No, um, actually, um, we we uh, we didn't want to turn the blog into a platform for just pushing the iPhone app because. Um, a lot of people don't have iPhones yet. Yes, it's shocking, but a lot of people <laughs> still don't have an iPhone. Um, and we didn't want the blog to become about, hey, you have to get the iPhone app. So definitely it's there. You go to our blog, you see on the right hand there's download now. And every once in a while when we update the app uh, or when something comes out, we, we do mention that. But uh, it did give us, uh, I guess, the initial seating. Um, and since the blog is also followed by uh, uh, reporters from the LA Times, the Washington Post, and several others, um, 
it was very easy for me to just uh, send them an email and say, check out what we've done. Um, maybe you'd like to write about it. So we did get some initial write-ups. Um, but um, I had, I st it's still hard. Look, it's really, really hard to rise above the noise. The, the number one thing you need to, to do is to have a good app. And when we launched, we had no idea if we had a good app or not. We thought we did, but not until the initial feedbacks came back. And we were actually featured in Swiss Miss, which is a, a very famous design blog. Um, when we saw that we made it to Swiss Miss, then you know, one of my biggest fears was that our unconventional design uh, was, was a hit. Because um, it went against a, a lot of the uh, UI guidelines uh, by Apple. And then uh, a few months later, when we were invited to Apple headquarters, <laughs> they told us, uh, their marketing told us how amazing the app was designed and how well it worked. And uh, I knew we had taken the right uh, choice. So, so to rise above the noise, you really have to have something unique. And I think we're answering a real need that a lot of people have. Um, so definitely a good app. Definitely the fact that we had the blog was good. But um, um, there, there's a good buzz around it. Uh, it gets good write-ups and coverage sometimes even on TV shows. Um, I mean, we're not Angry Birds by any means, but we're getting a good, uh, good uh, download rate. We've been in the top 10 health apps for the last three months. Um, so that's good, and uh, we hope to continue and grow. So, I mean, w what came first? Uh, you know, obviously, uh, when I mean, why don't you walk us through a, a quick demonstration about what the product does, and then because I've got sure. some questions about how you've built up the database and how you built up the product database and the feedback. Sure. So, w walk through it so there's context. Okay, so maybe we'll start with uh, with a real life uh, problem and how convenient. <laughs> I have a box of cereal here that I actually fold it up and carry in my briefcase for demo. So this is a cereal that uh, seems to be very healthy, uh, but it's actually a nutrition imposter. It, it seems healthy because it says it's made with whole grains and it has a picture of uh, almonds and cranberries. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to launch the FujiK iPhone app. And I hope on Skype we can see it well enough. Yeah. It launches uh, straight into a scanner mode, so you don't need to sign up or register. You just scan. And what I'll do now is I'll scan the barcode here. And I'm sorry, but I need to look at it so you don't get to see. <laughs> it's Otherwise, right. I won't be able to focus it. Okay, so it's scanned. Yep. And immediately what we see here on the screen is uh, two pieces of information out of three that are really important. The first one is a letter grade, and you can see this product does not score very well. Uh, the second thing you see are the headlines or bullet points just below that. Um, and these are, the, these are the explanations that tell you why it got that low grade. And the third thing we offer, if you can see the word alternatives up here, yep. um, we don't want you to get bummed out by the fact that you scanned a product that's not so great. So you can actually um, choose healthier alternatives here. And if you click on one of them, it'll show you a brief comparison. And if you click on it again, it'll show you the rating for that. So basically, um, that's the product. Uh, that's the value proposition. Scan and immediately see if this is something you want or not. And if not, choose something healthier. So, you know, there are a lot of applications that just give you one dimension of that, it, it, you know, where you scan and, and it gives you information about the product. It doesn't put a spin on it like you guys do. Not a spin, um, but a, a grade on it, for example, or reasoning behind the, the you know, the grade yeah. itself. There are a lot of calorie counting apps yeah. out there and there are price comparison apps. Um, actually, we're working with some of the price comparison apps um, across, uh, across promotion and cross content. Um, we, we didn't want something that would be just for people who are trying to lose weight and count calories. We wanted to, to focus on, on real food. Okay, so my, my little, my thing is, I don't believe uh, that you can be healthy by going on a diet. I think diet should be the way you live, not something temporal to lose weight. And I believe diet needs to be mostly from real food, um, ideally not processed, which means 95% of the stuff in the supermarket is not something I would want to buy. But that's in the perfect utopian world, which no, nobody lives in, because we have busy lives, two working parents, three kids, 
Um, um, and a lot of times you just need the help from the food industry, you know, the freezer aisles. So we're not out, we're not setting out to change everybody to growing food in their backyard, but we do think that within the supermarket choices you can and should make better choices within your constraints. So take this cereal for example, it's got three and a half teaspoons of sugar, that's more than some of the children's cereal. There's no reason you should be eating this and there's no reason that you should think this is healthy. So what we offer you is to trade up to something that maybe has only a teaspoon and a half of sugar. Now that saving of two teaspoons, if you eat cereal every day for a year, that's almost two pounds of body weight just from the sugar. So imagine if you're doing 20 or 30 little improvements, not just on the calories from sugar, but also on processed uh, ingredients, chemicals like the red number 40 we discussed earlier. Over the course of a year, what you'll see is that, wow, you're eating better, you may be losing a little bit of weight, you're also feeling better because you're eating more real food. And maybe through the app, we're also convincing you to start cooking some more at home, thinking a, a little bit more about what you eat and what you're feeding your family. And our hope is that if we do this with enough millions of consumers, um, this will actually take a dent out of the obesity epidemic and, and all the other illnesses we have as a result of this modern food industry. Lots there. Lots there, Hemi, because I've got a number of questions around this. And, and it, it really, I, I think the first visible um, corollary here that I can make is that you, you have a passion for the space and it and it and it's mimicked in uh, in what you're doing with this application and and when you start to when you start to um, look you know if I was an entrepreneur I, I am an entrepreneur but if I was looking at building in the mobile space I, I see a lot of disconnect sometimes uh, people run after opportunity more so than they run after their passions and and so how, how, have you been able to balance that you've become you said you were a foodie now you've become somewhat of a an, um, a content expert, a nutrition content expert, all right? Not a nutritionist, but maybe. Um, but how important is it that you understand the space and then find a, you know, fill that hole on uh, in the mobile space rather than just looking for an opportunity and and uh, kind of just driving towards that without uh, without a passion. Look, so I'll be the last person to dispense advice to other entrepreneurs about follow what to do. I can tell you what works for me. Sure. Um, when I need to work uh, 19 hours a day, uh, at first with zero or no pay, and now uh, on very limited funding, um, I need something more than just uh, this is a cool app. I need to really, really believe uh, in something. So for me, uh, it was clear um, after my I sold my first company that the next one. Uh, was going to be something that I was very passionate about, that I would have the energy and really want to do something, uh, you know, world changing. I don't know if we'll change the world with this, that's my hope, but it, it definitely adds a lot of energy and a lot of, uh, a lot of power um, in everything you do. It shows, you know, you see it now, uh, it, it shows when you're trying to recruit people to your team, when you're raising money, when you're talking with consumers, uh, when people see that you really believe in what you're doing, uh, it tends to be contagious. So yes. that's what's worked for me. Um, that doesn't mean that aren't great opportunities out there that you don't necessarily need to be passionate about. Some entrepreneurs are passionate about making a lot of money, and that's a great driver for many people, <laughs> including myself. You know? I mean, I'd love for this to be a, a great financial success as well. So, oh, I mean, how how do you turn this into uh, into a revenue generator? I mean, this okay. is it seems like what you're doing is 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 great for uh, you know for the planet um, yeah. and uh, health in, in general and identifying some key issues that are going on certainly in the in the way that people are marketing and pack packaging food goods. Um, mm -hmm. But so how but how do you make money and step out of that altruism that you seem to be in right now? So it's a great question, and uh, we kind of uh, we had a lot of uh, internal debates um, whether this should be something that consumers subscribe to or pay the ninety nine cents to download. And we we quickly realized that you can't really build a big business or a world changing uh, enterprise uh, by charging for an app. Um, 
So we said, where else can you get the money? And the answer was very clear. You take it from the food industry. How can you take money from a food industry if you're judging them? And uh, I'm sure uh, that some of our users, the moment we'll start uh, monetizing by taking, uh, by doing product promotions, will uh, will have some commentary on our objective uh, algorithms. Um, but you know, if you want free products, and that's just the way the web works, and mobile apps in many cases as well. Um, so our our monetization is going to be uh, working with brands that. Um, will tend to be the healthier ones because the non-healthy brands won't want to pay for a platform that says their products don't rate well. <laughs> yes. Luckily, there are a lot of healthy a, a lot of healthy products, usually smaller brands that are trying to break out. And actually, if you think of what we're doing, uh, we can we can provide a platform that's very targeted uh, to a geographic location, to a certain demographic. And now you have brands that can't afford to pay the million dollar slotting fees to be on the eye level uh, shelf space at a supermarket, but they can uh, now be discovered by consumers that would be interested in them, whether it's to be purchased from a, a lower uh, shelf in the supermarket or maybe online or some or through some other method. Um, and, and there's a big opportunity. I mean, food advertising uh, is about $40 billion a year in the U.S., um, it's slowly been moving over the years online, and now it's slowly starting to trickle into mobile, and it's just going to explode. And um, the interesting opportunity for brands on Fujicate is that people are, are holding product in hand, and they're at the supermarket, they're at the point of decision. So from an ROI perspective, it doesn't get better than that. The person is, is thinking, hmm, which should I buy, this product or that product, and Fujicate helps establish a decision um, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities there whether you know if it's a person that just scanned uh, Gerber or, or some baby formula you know that they're gonna need diapers you can offer them that um, if a person scanned uh, a, a spaghetti sauce you may want to offer them whole wheat pasta um, if a person scanned a cereal and now there are 500 different alternatives that are better maybe the first one or two that you present are in the same way that Google does sponsored links, you could do sponsored promotion. So there's a lot of ways to do that. To be honest, we aren't really uh, focusing on that right now. We're focusing on improving the user experience, um, just creating a better, better app, adding lots more products to it so that almost every scan will be successful, uh, creating more uh, more opportunities to discover, uh, more features, um, adding additional platforms like Android. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of things we need to do before we talk about uh, just making the money. We rather create a, a very large and substantial user base first. Well, and speaking into a large user base is obviously the best way to to turn on revenue. Because, you know, do you feel that by adding, you know, by focusing on revenue too early with a small user base? Uh, you might turn people off or, or you know, what is it about, I mean, when is the deciding factor for you to turn on revenue? Uh, well, I'm not the expert on that, uh, but I think every company has to take into consideration what, what, uh, what effort is required. Um, in some cases, it's really intrinsic and it just makes sense to turn it on from day one. Mm -hmm. In some cases, uh, the focus on monetization, especially if the monetization may cause, uh, uh, a decrease in the user experience, um, you need to weigh that uh, if you want to do that or not. But for one of, one of our monetization opportunities that I've uh, for some reason forgot to mention earlier is coupons. So coupons are actually something that can increase the value of food you pay to consumers because now they're not only choosing healthy food, they're also saving money on it. Um, so maybe that's something that we should do as early as we can. But to chase after monetization opportunities with advertisers, a lot of times you need to show a certain amount of uh, a cert a user base that's uh, at a certain minimum, because otherwise it's just not interesting. Um, well, I mean, so, how, so, how, much, uh, how, how much does a product change 
when you take these two routes. So the first route is you, you build uh, you build out a great product, you build it on multiple platforms, you build the functionality so it's useful to a user, and you do it based on uh, you know no overlord, no nobody uh, you know who's paying you to to uh, to use your product or to advertise on your product, versus going after revenue, where uh, do you think that going after revenue influences the features you put in the product or in, in, in influences the purity of the product right off the bat? Well, I can tell you that in no way it's going to affect uh, our algorithms. Uh, we haven't talked about that yet, but I hope we'll get to that yeah. soon. Um, th it won't affect, it's, it's, it's science, it's, science uh, it's algorithms, it's all automated, so there's no way that we could say, ah, Brand X has now uh, uh, paid us, so we should uh, uh, automatically uh, increase the grade. That, yeah. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Uh, now, there's some people that won't believe us, and uh, that's their choice. Um, but you know we have our we have our uh, our morals or whatever you want to call them or the way we want to, to things to to work and I think um, that most people will be understanding that this company needs to pay for the programmers and for yes. for the, yes. the operations and this is how it's done. Um, so when to turn on the revenue? It's a great question. If I go back to what you asked me and uh, to be honest. Right now, we're not at that uh, junction quite yet. I think in three to six months, we'll probably be able to answer it much, uh, much more fully. Well, it, it, I think that that's a it's it's a good answer. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, it might come down to timing, gut, feel, um, you know, sense, um, and uh, I, I know that uh, you know from talking to a lot of people in this space, uh, you know, the product's never done, so there's never a perfect time, right? So. Uh, ultimately, I'm waiting for the product to be done as much as I'm waiting to to have a, a big enough user base that says, "Wow, we trust what Fujikate is telling us." Yeah. Um, also, sometimes there are opportunities that are thrown in your face. I mean, we're starting to get uh, emails at least once or twice a week from from brands um, and companies and ad networks about how, "Hey, how are you guys monetizing? You should come work with us." You know, yeah. we we have we work with a lot of brands. We could give you these high CPMs. Or um, you need to do this or that. So I mean, I think some t some things just naturally start to happen once you reach a certain level of traction. Yeah, well, I, and I think that that's that's where that yeah, it's a natural feeling ultimately when 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 that when that should happen. Um, I'm gonna switch uh, over here to uh, you mentioned something earlier on about uh, you know uh, kind of going against the grain and the UI guidelines that Apple puts out there uh -huh. and building your own UI and and that really helped you. Um, uh, help create awareness, certainly uh, um, from Apple's perspective and a bunch of other companies. And um, talk talk about that experience. You know, uh, what was it that you guys did that was so unique that uh, that that resonated with Apple, for example? Well, I, I don't know exactly what, but I can tell you what our process was uh, as we we got going. So uh, in uh, in August of last year, we we put the team together and we worked with two designers, not one. Uh, one is a person I've been working with for over three years, and she's an artist. And the other was a user experience expert who had done some projects on iPhone. And um, and and we said it was clear to us that we needed to do something that would look different and stand out. Um, so we started doing some sketches, and then we talked about um, what the user experience needs to be, and we talked about what's the minimal uh, amount of information uh, that needs to be displayed for this to be valuable to a user, and it was about a third of the stuff we wanted to put on the product page. And then we said, how do we squeeze everything in, and we did a lot of uh, sketches trying to see what we could put in, what we can't put out. and. And we realized that we wanted to utilize uh, as, as much as we can out of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't want the bottom bar to be there all the time. Um, we saw that Facebook had done something similar. Um, so that was an interesting concept, and we started pursuing that. And um, eventually that led to the type of navigation that we set up. Uh, we knew that we wanted some stuff to be persistent, like a button at the top right that is for scanning, so yeah. that from any screen you can always reach the scan mode. And uh, we wanted, uh, we didn't want the standard uh, iPhone colors and the standard iPhone look and feel because 
it would be quickly forgotten. It so, would blend after, very well, wouldn't it, with everything else? Yeah. So after about almost a month of iterations, we finally came up with a design. When we launched the first version of the app, there were still a few kinks in the navigation. It, it wasn't that great, but we, could, we quickly figured those out. So within a month, we already had the app and the navigation pretty much as you see today. So, I mean, did you, did you push something out that you thought was um, the best product uh, at the time? Or no did, way, man. No way. No? Okay. It was, but it, the, best it was the minimal product. Okay. You know, I read, I read all the stuff about the market product fit, minimal viable product. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. And, uh, and you know, 37 signals, which you mentioned before. Product's never ready. The product's never great. Um, it's never good enough. Um, thankfully, I've been around for a while, so I know not to get too nervous about it. And we released a product that, had I been five or ten years earlier, I would have shit in my pants. Uh, <laughs> so, ah, it's not good enough. People are going to scream. Um, but, uh, I mean, we did have our fears uh, and worries, but as the feedback started to come in, we saw that actually... We had made the right decisions uh, on most of the uh, most of the UI and most of the features. Did you guys just do that based on on spec? On what you know, as you said, you worked through this process of, of UI, but you had to have an idea of what you know what features were supposed to be in there, or what you wanted in there. Did you guys do that yeah. on based on your knowledge, or did you ask people about what they'd like to see? We we did both. Um, I think uh, if I go back to the blog, writing the blog uh, for, for two years uh, up to that point really, and getting the feedbacks there and, and a survey that I once did with the blog readers about what's interesting to them kind of gave me the direction of the type of things people uh, would be interested in learning. And one thing was clear that people don't want you to repeat like uh, uh, exactly what's on the nutrition label. So nobody yeah. cares or a lot of maybe people cared, but I don't care to just to reiterate how many carbs and how many calories and how many grams of fat are in there. It's already on the label. I don't need to repeat that. But if it says it has 12 G of sugar, or here it says 13 G sugar, that's interesting because most people don't know what G means, yeah. don't know what 13 G. And if we can say, hey, that means it's got three and a half teaspoons of sugar, now you're talking. So it was, it was clear those three core tenets of the pro of the product, which is the quick glance grade, which is really important to really color code it, tell you good or not good for me. The bullet points, which are written in plain English, not in some uh, neutral speak, that was really important for us as well as a, as a core value to consumer. It gives the consumer the uh, the confidence to know that the grade wasn't some random decision, it's based on something. Yep. And the last thing was the alternatives. It was clear to us that we need to offer alternatives so that people won't feel uh, disappointed each time their pro product that they scan doesn't rate well. And then, <laughs> okay, what else do we need to add in there? So we threw in the calories because, you know, calories, they're like, they're like a rank above all the other nutrition considerations. And we added the little heart uh, that tells you how many people uh, have liked it or not. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason we did that, we, we wanted to create some sort of uh, additional parameters for making a decision, not just based on nutrition, but, um, you know, a product may score an A, but if it tastes like cardboard and nobody likes it. So the heart, the like or don't like feature was a way for people to vote up or down on products. And, and when we offer alternatives now, we, de we take into consideration, you know, it has to score better, but if it's also something that a lot of people like, that means it's great. So those are the things. And, and there were a whole bunch of other things we wanted to, to see if we should add or not, and we just decided not to. Keep it simple, you know, the Steve Jobs approach, less is more. Yep. And uh, I think it, ser it served us well. So, uh, I mean, it, obviously there's, there's a bunch of IP uh, opportunities here. Um, do you, do you look at this and say this is the size of the database of products? Do you look at this as we, you briefly touched on it, your algorithm is the IP here? Do you look at the number of users that you have contributing their likes? Is it a combination of all of those things that really sets you guys apart and, and defends your territory? Uh, all of the above. You know, ideas are a dime a dozen, yeah. and I'm sure I'm not the only person who has this idea. And there are other apps that are doing similar things. Um, 
We, we, our approach is a little different. First of all, uh, we do a lot of work on data. We have uh, many sources of data, including users. Um, if, uh, if you scan a product we don't have in the database, we'll actually ask you to um, take a few pictures of it for us, including the nutrition information. Mm -hmm. So we're actually getting, uh, we've gotten over 100,000 uh, email submissions from our users wow. so far. Wow, that's uh, great. Yeah, so you know we can't even enter them fast enough into the database. Um, so we're definitely creating uh, an interesting, uh, I think we have the best uh, database of unique UPCs uh, tied to products out of anybody else out there and it's just growing daily so that's definitely um, a, an advantage we have compared to others. And I think the way we, um, we dish out the information, uh, pun intended or not, um, is, is also unique. I don't know if it's defendable or not. Uh, I, I'm not a big believer in software patents. I just think uh, we're executing very well on there, on the ability to, to create an app that's kind of fun to use. I mean, we're getting tweets and, and emails and, and reviews on the app store. People are saying, I'm addicted to Fujicade. You know, I'm scanning everything in my house. I'm scanning everything at the grocery store. So there's kind of some sort of magic that happened there that, to be honest, I didn't know in advance that this is what would happen or how people we were hoping. We planned everything and I think we got a little bit lucky in some of the decisions we made um, that made this app so likable. So talk about that algorithm though. Um, so the way, we, the way we rate the products. The way you rate uh, the products, yeah. So okay, so uh, it's an algorithm. It's not that we have a dietitian sitting on each and every product that comes <laughs> in. Um, one of our, uh, on our advisory board is a professor by the name of Adam Dronowski. He's, a, he's, an, he's a, an expert in uh, nutrition and uh, epidemiology. And for the last 10 years, he's been creating algorithms called, uh, uh, based around nutrition-rich foods or what foods are nu nutrient-dense. And his algorithms basically look at the nutrients in a, in a food product. And, and it, he kind of uh, does this... Uh, a sum of the good of the good nutrients and subtracts the bad nutrients, and uh, he's done a lot of testing on his algorithms and, and, and came to some optimum. And what we did is we took his algorithms and we kind of uh, turned the I don't want to say turned them upside down, but we we took a Ford Model T and we turned it into a Porsche because we added a lot of additional considerations, um, not just the nutrients but also the ingredients. So we take an, a very long ingredient list and we parse it into every single ingredient and every single ingredient is either one that contributes or or uh, or, or t either adds points to the product or, or takes points, subtracts points from it. Some, some don't do anything, they're neutral, but um, yeah. so we take that into consideration. We also look at the category that the product is in. Um, uh, if you're a cereal, then we're very interested in fiber and sugar if you're a, a yogurt, fiber isn't really important to us because you don't expect to find fiber in, in a yogurt. So we have about 100 different categories and the weights of the nutrients and ingredients are different per category. So we take all that and it's this pretty expansive uh, algorithm and uh, it, it spits out a grade at the end. And then uh, for every category there's a, a range of grades um, all the way from an A down to a D but not all categories rate uh, in, in the entire range. For example, soft drinks are D to D+. Plus. Yes. Um, yogurts are from a C all the way up to an A. Cereals are from a, I think, from a C- minus up to an A. Fruits and vegetables are from a B to an A, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then you, you, you basically, it, it's, uh, it's data soup, right? Uh, and you you jam it in there, so you can you can you can continuously add products uh, to yeah. this database, and it just f and it fills it in automatically. It's, yeah, I mean, every once in a while, uh, there's products that have new ingredients that we you know our parser doesn't recognize yet. Yeah. So there's always tweaking going on, and you know we get feedback from uh, from users and from other scientists that say, hey, you know, we think that uh, your uh, consideration of saturated fat in this and that category has been too uh, too light or too heavy um, or sometimes we just get people say how, how did this crappy product uh, get such a great score and we take a look and we say wow interesting uh, there's this ingredient here that we didn't consider enough or maybe 
there's this nutrient here that we need to um, modify uh, yep. its weight. So we're constantly tweaking. Um, you know, the changes aren't major. So maybe a product that rated a B is now a B minus or something like that. I think what's more important for, for the consumer is that they get a basic understanding of where this product is. Is it, is it something I want or not? And, and a little bit of an explanation. And we're also constantly working on adding more explanations or more bullet points, uh, refining that. Um, so th it, there's definitely constant work going on there, but you know it's it's already 90% there. So everything we add on top is is great, but we've done most of the heavy lifting already. Do you know how many products you have in the database already? Yeah, we have uh, at last count, uh, I think uh, definitely over 200,000. I'm thinking probably around 210,000 products, um, and it's growing every day by a few hundred. Yeah. Um, so, uh, a lot. And it's still not perfect. I mean, our scan success rate is only around 80%, which means there are still 20% of scans that end up in, uh, that end up in product not found. Yeah. Um, but uh, we found that 50,000 50, of our products account for over 70% of the successful scans or maybe 60% of the successful scans. So, you know, it's not linear. No. You have the very popular products and then you have the ones that get scanned maybe once or twice ever so far. So let me let me talk about that because that's a really interesting thing is that, you know, I, I look at what it's under this kind of title about what's the future of this product, right? So where do you hope to take this? Uh -huh. and, and it's really interesting because all of a sudden you've got... Uh, You've got a, a product that's in, in multiple thousands of people's of hands, right? Because you're in the top 10 in, in, in any category yep. <clears throat> in the App Store. You've expanded into Android. So you're getting scans every day from yep. around the world. Well, only the U.S. right now. It's a U.S. product. So, so from around the U.S. It's big enough. From around the U.S. It, yeah, it's a big enough market. Um, and uh, so obviously there's some great analytics that are coming out of this. So you, you, you're able to see some of the some of the most requested and most, um, uh, you know, maybe there's not a way to close the loop on whether they, they scan it and buy it but or they scan it and choose something else. But you, you're able to now paint a really great picture for retailers, for product owners um, about how they can market their product, where they should market their product, the impact on, uh, you know, the diminuing, diminuing impact of shelf level in a in a grocery store um, and then you've got all that data right is that part of the business plan that data it, it's something that uh, we definitely have written down as a bullet point in uh, you know in our business plan uh, I think it's too early uh, you need uh, several orders of magnitudes more <clears throat> yeah. data points sure uh, we'll get there one day um, it's not something that we're actively uh, focusing on right now, but definitely there's some interesting nuggets. For example, what's the most popular scan? Right. Like, are you asking That's, me? Take a guess. Yeah, take a guess. Well, you know, my uh, so I've taken this out for a bunch of test drives, obviously, at, at my local grocery. I'm in Canada, so uh, the scan didn't work, but the search engine still works on it very well. Um, but uh, so I would have to say that it would be a uh, cereal. Um, and could it be a like a, a Fruit Loops or some some sugary cereal like that? That's my guess. Okay, well, cereal as a category is very big. It's uh, I think it's our number one category. But as a as a product, so in the top ten, we have lots of soft drinks and mm -hmm. and waters, the small size bottle, and we tried to figure why why is that? And the reason is a lot of people hear about the app sitting at their computer watching this interview and they grab the first thing that's on the table or nearby which is usually a can of coke unfortunately or a bottle of mineral water right but taking those aside the, the most the most popular product is the nutella hazelnut spread people wow. love that product i love that product it's not very healthy, even though they try to say that it's all natural and it's made with hazelnuts. Got a cup of milk. Oh, oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that BS. So, you know, we have Nutella at home. My kids love it. And we, we have, uh, they, they get it on their toast or, or on, their, on their bun every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, but we don't uh, kid ourselves that it's a healthy food. But it's just interesting that that's the number one scan product uh, af after the immediate scans of, of the drinks on the table. 
So, uh, I mean, when do you guys get into publishing the 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 uh, you, you know the top ten requested or the top one hundred requested uh, products that are out there? I mean, that that to me would be a good corollary, a good compliment to the blog, right? Which is like, hey, did you know that you know the last thirty yes. days, you know, Nutella was the number one. You know, you take you take that top and the bottom. Nutella was yeah. the number one uh, scanned product. Uh, you know, that that's certainly got to be great uh, analytics for those brands um, because you can localize that as well couldn't you of course. I mean yep. speculating here obviously but because um, yeah, because really the the data that you put in is valuable the algorithm that you you display the data the data that comes out is valuable but the data that you're gathering is equally as valuable there's three parts to this obviously and and mm -hmm. uh, that third part I think is, is could be pretty lucrative at some point Maybe one day, yeah. Maybe one, one day. day. What about uh, so? What's the future here? Like, so I, I understand that you know you build out the product, you build out the features, you you get more product in, you get more users, you 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 kind of grow this community, and then once that's done, do you start thinking about licensing the database? You've already said you partnered. So our goal is not to be an app. Um, the app is our is the first step and probably the correct step uh, in, in a much larger goal. Um, what we really want to be is a force um, that helps um, consumers make better choices. Um, and you know we really are, we're building a brand and um, the brand can live in many places. So you mentioned licensing. Uh, we have an API uh, so that other, other parties, whether it's other iPhone apps or other websites, can use uh, our content. So, if somebody queries, uh, you know, Fruit Loops on a website under some nutrition website, there's no reason there shouldn't be. Here's what Fujicate says. Yep. Um, we also need to have our own website, by the way, which is something we haven't gotten to yet. We're only five people on the team, um, but. Uh, our, our, the long-term goal is for Fujicate to be the brand uh, that you turn to for advice when you need to make a food or nutrition decision. Um, and it could eventually even be a, a Fujicate uh, seal of approval, on not on this product, but you know, on, <laughs> physically on the products themselves. Uh, so we're, 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 it's all about sharing the information on any third uh uh, party platform that's interested. We're already doing it with uh, a price uh, comparison uh, app called Shop Savvy. Yeah, um, it's I a know, really guys. That's brand. Rylan Barnes and his and his group. I've interviewed those guys. Great company. Love those guys. Yeah. So um, when you scan a food product uh, with uh, Shop Savvy, um, it it actually shows you a little nutrition grade by Fujicate. Love it. If you click on that, you see more information, and then you can download our app as well. So. It helps build the brand. It also brings in some some downloads, and we're we're in discussions with many other companies to do the similar things. So, uh, last question. Uh, you know, you've been very very uh, open, Hemi. I really appreciate that. Um, it just sounds like uh, mobile to me for you guys was that entry level. It's it's what you know Eric Schmidt calls you know mobile first, uh, where, yeah. where you, the entrance that's the that's the that's the lowest, not the lowest. But the the most accessible way to get into this business and find usership is that what you guys are doing? Well, so I've outlined what we want Fujicate to be. Yep. So let's say, okay, I'm trying to build the brand uh, around food decisions. Now, how do I get Mindshare? Yeah. Um, you need to do something that resonates, that brings the most value to people. Now, a website is nice and interesting, but not a lot of people are going to go to a website and start typing in products that they have in their shopping bag that they just came home with. Right. Because they're too busy putting it in the fridge and getting dinner ready. Yep. But there's a 10 second uh, window of opportunity each time somebody picks up a product on the shelf and reads what's here and reads what's here. And if you can, in those 10 seconds, get the person to use an iPhone or Android app to scan and, and use your product, that's amazing. So mobile first was, uh, was a no-brainer for yeah. us. It was clear to us that we could go on with a, we need to have a, web, uh, a mobile app way, way, way before we have a website. And that's exactly what we've done. And and so, uh, but it was always the vision that this is going to be much, much larger than just yeah. the, the mobile play. 
Yeah, yeah. The mobile play is just a way to get our foot in the door and to start uh, getting traction and building the brand. Um, we definitely want to expand uh, to be something much bigger. How would you have done this without mobile? Could you have done it without mobile? I don't think we could have. I, I don't think it would have been relevant. I mean, you need something to help you make a decision at the supermarket, yeah. not after the fact at home. I mean, some people use this at home, but really the value here is in real time. God, think of, uh, think of Fujikate as having your own personal dietitian wherever you go and wherever you need to make a decision. I love it. I love it. I love it. So this is available uh, in the U.S. only. Uh, plans to expand the product category to like the products are into different countries. Uh... Definitely, definitely. I, I think uh, the U.S. is not the only country that's having problems with uh, the Western diet. Yeah. Uh, uh, you guys up in Canada are unfortunately following in our footsteps. We are. We and... love our big gulps. We do. Yes. Exactly. Um, so uh, your donut place is Tim Hortons, right? It is. I think we've we've got that in the U.S. now. They brought it into New York and a few other places. Yeah, so right. anyway, definitely planning to expand into additional countries. We just want to make sure that uh, we've got everything down pat in the U.S. and uh, hopefully we'll we'll expand. Uh, if not next year, definitely the year after that. So uh, where can people find out more information about about the product, about you guys, about your goals, your dreams, uh, your blog, with with some of the stuff that you've written about? Where can they find out? So fujukate.com, fujukate.com slash blog. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but yeah. get fujukated. Get, yep. Um, Facebook, Twitter. We have a very nice following on all these uh, platforms, um, and of course on the App Store and uh, Android Marketplace. Well, this has been great. Uh, you know, Hemi, I really appreciate your time, uh, your your candid nature yeah, of this yeah. conversation. It 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 really um, shows that you know building a community around a product is is as important as building the product. The quality of that product has to be very high, serve a need, but um, and and also I think that mobile it it can be your end game, but it also can be the entrance way entrance into the the actual business that you want to be in. Um, and it's and it's a really great way to start uh, to see if there is a demand for this and and it satisfies a need. And I love the fact that this is a company. You couldn't have created this company the way that you wanted to create this company without the the uh, the value of a, of a mobile device in somebody's hand. So it truly really is that mobile first approach. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And I, plus, I love using the product. It it made me go find a um, you know move away from honey bunches of oats uh, into uh, you know cashy uh, go lean product, right? Uh, which was a which an a an a product. And I think that that's what really resonates it comes down to a simple 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 letter that says look do you want a b or an a and naturally instinctively it's like well you know i'm going to take the a i'm not going to yeah, settle for the b you don't want to be a c uh, student or a b student you want to be an a student exactly. you want to be an a here too right but even a if you bring even if you, even if you bring somebody from a d to a c or a c to a b i mean exactly. that's the goal a lot of parents are giving the uh, their kids the iPhone and say, "Hey, kids, go to the cereal aisle and bring back anything that rates a B plus or higher." I love that. I love that. <laughs> right. Fruit Loops. I don't loops. know how your kids are, but uh, you can They're, try. It. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'll share a, a quick experience. Is that we were we were in our, our local gro grocery store on the weekend, and I was using your product, and and uh, I was showing them. They 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 came up to the Lucky Charms and Fruit Loops, and uh, th this is what they want. And I said, "Okay, well, let's take a look." And I want to show you what it looks like, and and you know they're C minus um, uh, for Fruit Loops, and uh, and I said, well, no, they're not good for you because it's a C minus. What you want is an A, and they understood. They said, okay, Dad, I'll put it away. And I, I don't know how long I can I can convince my kids that that's what it, that's what it is, but uh, but ultimately that that small decision, if you do that many times over, as you said, it's going to have a massive impact. And I and I I love what you guys are doing. As a uh, as a guy who likes to eat properly and and share that with my kids, so Hemi, thank you so much for thank doing you this. Very much for this opportunity. Well, I love it. We've been speaking with uh, Hemi Weingarten, who is the co-founder of a company called Fujicate. Fujicate. Go to fujicate.com or do a do a quick search on uh, on App Store or the uh, Android Marketplace to go and and find it and download it. Start scanning some food. Get healthy. S stop sitting behind a computer. Get healthy. Exactly. I want to thank Hemi for doing this. Really appreciate your time. You folks who are still watching and listening, much. know that you found a ton of value in this. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other episode uh, at untether at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time on untether.tv. Thanks, Emmy.